Good afternoon, everybody from sunny Yorkshire. My name is Frank Finlay. I'm director of the Cultural Institute here at the University of Leeds. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the latest and indeed the last of our alumni webinars, Meet the Researchers, Cultural Connections. This has been a series of events, which I have to say have certainly enlivened my summer in this strange and unusual summer like no other. It's, these are events which showcase the university's strengths in the arts and um, humanities. We're a site of world-leading research in these areas and indeed also of cultural and artistic innovation. I'm going to say a few words about the Cultural Institute before um, mentioning just what the format for today is going to be and then I will introduce our two speakers. So the Cultural Institute uh, was set up a number of years ago to help the university meet its strategic ambitions in a number of key areas. For our students, we work in partnership with the arts and cultural organisations in the city region, as well as with the broader commercial creative industries, to provide them with experiential opportunities that they might not otherwise get via volunteering, by internships, placements and the like. And some of our, our partner organisations are very significant in the area. We have a long association with Opera North. We've worked in conjunction with the Yorkshire Sculpture International, the wonderful um, International Festival of Sculpture only last year, um, with theatres, literary festivals and the like. Another purpose of the Cultural Institute is to broker partnerships for our researchers um, and at a time when the research landscape is increasingly focused on finding solutions to complex global challenges for example the environmental crisis and that's kind of germane to our discussions today and finally the third um, focus that we have in the cultural institute is to make a contribution to enriching the cultural and artistic life of the wider city and region. And this we do through our support for a number of significant events. Um, we're a partner on the Leeds 2023 Festival of Culture that will be taking place in um, a few short years. We support the Leeds International Piano Competition, etc., etc. So, without further ado, I said I'd say a little bit about the format. You do have a chat function, we'd love to hear uh, on the chat function from where you, you're attending today's webinar. Um, there is a Q&A session planned at the end. We'd like you please to submit any questions that you might have on the Q&A function within the Zoom platform. And um, we're going to hear from David and Pippa in a, a moment and we'll look to wrap things up on time by about a quarter past one. But if we need to run over just a little bit, our controllers, um, our wonderful team of colleagues in the alumni office have given me the permission so to do. So um, we were just joking, we were doing a little technical rehearsal before we all came on stream that the lovely Debussy piano music kind of put us in desert island disc mode. So our castaways today in that spirit, um, I'd like to introduce you to Professor David Higgins, who's been a colleague of the university for nigh on 15 years now having taught previously in Cambridge, Chester and, and York. And David's focus uh, of his research is on British romanticism and environmental humanities. Environmental humanities, in, in brief, this is where um, humanities approaches and methods are brought to bear on issues relating to the environment. Um, David, in, in, in recent times, has been increasingly motivated as a researcher by opportunities to engage with broader, uh, to engage broader audiences with environmental issues. And this has led to a number of very significant public engagement collaborations. And you'll hear later on how the Landlines Project has engaged literally with millions of people. Dr. Pippa Marland, um, I've just discovered um, in our pre-talk uh, pre um, Chit Chat has had a career in music before returning to academia about seven or eight years ago. 
Pip has taught at um, a number of universities and now is research fellow um, at the University of Leeds on the AHRC funded landlines project. Pippa's work focuses on the study of culture and the environment and again this comes under the banner of the environmental humanities and she's particularly interested in the intersections of new materialism and eco-criticism and also emerging post-humanist approaches in green cultural studies. So without further ado, um, welcome David and Pippa and over to you. Hello everyone, um, hope you can hear me okay. Thank you very much, um, Frank. Um, thank you also to the alumni team for the invitation to speak about landlines. Um, and thanks to all of you for giving up your time to attend. Um, this is a joint presentation, so Pippa will follow me. Um, I'll be focusing mainly on the project research and Pippa will be focusing mainly on the public engagement, but uh, we've both been involved in both aspects. It's just, just for the convenience of splitting it for a joint presentation. I'm just going to see if I can get these slides moving. Yeah, there we go. Um, I'm going to leave that quotation from Robert McFarlane, of course, one of the most um, lauded uh, contemporary British nature writers. I'm just going to leave that quotation hanging. Um, we have it as the sort of epigraph to the Landlines website. People will say more about the website in a bit. Um, I'm going to try, unusually for an academic, to keep to time. I'll speak for about 10 minutes before handing over to Pippa. Uh, you may get some ambient noise from my uh, baby daughter who's just decided to finish her nap early um, but she is absolutely fine so don't worry she has been cared for my partner is at home so i'll just give you an overview of the project to start what is landlines um, british and north american nature writing have, has become a very popular and powerful prose genre in the last 30 years there are high profile prizes, um, spaces in bookshops, and, and some very kind of well-known authors like McFarlane. Um, and so the project looks at, at nature writing and partly for reasons of, of, of feasibility, focusing on, on British nature writing um, and how it articulates and constructs human relations to the environment. When I, when I wrote this sentence, I, I sort of looked at it again and thought, do I, do I mean articulates and constructs? And I think I do. What I mean is that nature writing doesn't only describe or express how we relate to, relate to our environment, it can actually play a role in shaping those relations. Um, the project focuses on British nature writing from the late 18th century to the present day. Um, there are a number of reasons to kind of start in the, in the late 18th century. Uh, one of them is the publication of Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne, which I've already seen mentioned a couple of times on the chat. Um, seen um, and often cited by contemporary British nature writers as a, as a foundational text in nature writing. Um, another key figure is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who had a huge impact on European culture in the period. Um, and one of those impacts was pitching nature against culture, but also in bringing kind of autobiography and natural history together in a very innovative way. Um, the late 18th century is, is, is kind of the beginning of my period, the Romantic period, um, and often seen by scholars as, as, as the start of something like modern ecology, even though the term did not exist then, and personal nature writing. I mean, I, I'm always a bit resistant to kind of, you know, a, a discourse of sudden cultural shifts, but I, I think it, is, it does make sense to, to, to start in the late 18th century, something is, is new is happening there in terms of writing about nature. Um, the project is a collaboration between the Universities of Leeds, St Andrews and Sussex, as well as various um, non-academic bodies, which we will talk about. Um, it's led by Professor Graham Huggin at Leeds. I'm one of the co-investigators and funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, who I have to mention, but also they've been, beyond giving us some money, they've also been really supportive in promoting the project and coming up with ideas for, for new activities. Um, it's led to lots of publications of public engagement activities. The public engagement particularly has gone far beyond the original application. And I think it's important to note it's, it's not been simply kind of um, us, us displaying our research findings. It's been interactive. Um, it's focused on enabling people to develop their own creative responses to the natural world. And it's fed back into the research as being dialogic. So 
what are the project's key questions? These aren't exactly what was in the original application, but they've kind of emerged over the last two or three years. To what extent is British prose nature writing a distinctive genre? It's quite hard to define nature writing, though I feel I kind of know it when I see it, but I'll, I'll come back to that in the next slide. How does it interact with scientific understandings of the natural world? So I think I understand nature writing is as different in some respects to what you might call technical natural history or ecology, but it does draw on that. Uh, nature writers often have scientific training. As you go back in time, the boundaries are much less clear because there's less specialization, intellectual specialization, if you go back, say, to the, to the 18th and 19th centuries. To what extent is nature writing dominated by relatively privileged voices, white male middle class people like me? Um, clearly, this is a very important issue and it ties in with, with even broader debates about access to nature, um, access to culture. I'm, I'm a keen uh, bird watcher and there's been a lot of soul searching among bird watching communities recently about, about um, inclusivity or, or the lack thereof. And I'll come back to this question too. How does it respond to different kinds of crisis? Um, personal, political, representational, and environmental. Um, three of those terms are probably fairly self-explanatory. By representational, I mean that kind of crisis that, that literature often responds to. That question of the extent to which language can give an adequate account of the world. That's, um, for obvious reasons, very pressing when it comes to nature writing. Um, and I think for me, the best nature writers kind of work away at that issue. What, what's, what can language do in terms of connecting us to the natural world, but also what are its limitations? What kind of distances remain? And finally, um, what's it for? What's the value of nature writing at a time of rapid biodiversity loss and global heating? Um, is it a kind of pleasant distraction? Or can it have some sort of more urgent value? Can it, can it even co contribute to the kind of solutions that Frank was talking about at the start of the lecture? Key findings. I mean, these, these are very, very broad, as you expect, because they're on one slide. Um, there's much more detail. And here's the plug in the uh, book that will be out next year, I hope, with Cambridge University Press. 100,000 words of nuance. So um, I'm just giving some kind of headlines here. Nature writing is a complex amalgam of different kinds of writing. So one might think of travel writing, autobiography, natural history, and so on. I think one of the things we try and do in the book is, is kind of unpick that amalgam to some extent and show how it's changed over time. So it's, it's a pretty messy form. And interestingly, I think, especially in the Romantic period, but also beyond that, it often incorporates prose and poetry. So even though our focus is largely on prose, we can't entirely exclude poetry because sometimes it's within those prose texts. Um, however, I think it does do something distinctive um, from the late 18th century, excuse me, by being personal, uh, occasional, that is based on a particular moment, uh, local, and understanding non-human nature as an active force rather than a passive object of study. So it's not, it's not doing taxonomy, or if it is doing taxonomy, it's also doing something else. And for me, the best nature writing is simultaneously inward and outward looking. It's about what happens to the self in relation to, 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 to nature and, and non-human entities, but it's also about them. It's not kind of entirely caught up in the self. Um, it's much more complex, diverse, experimental, and rhetorically self-conscious than is usually understood. Um, as, as a sort of card-carrying romanticist, I get very militant about this, that people often use kind of the, the adjective romantic as a sort of rather derisory term for talking about um, nature writing as, as sort of idealized or naive. But actually, um, the best romantic nature writing is very complex. Um, it's experimental, it reflects on its own limitations. And this experimental aspect has continued um, right to the present day. So I read a brilliant book um, from last year, the other day, called The Grassling by Elizabeth Jane Burnett. And that's doing, it's, it's great nature writing, it's doing really fascinating things with language and kind of on the cusp between prose and poetry. 
Um, it's always been culturally and politically engaged. Uh, that doesn't mean it's always been polemical or top thumping, but I don't think of it as an apolitical form. And again, that's a critique, that's a criticism that's sometimes made. Um, one only needs to, think, needs to think from the romantic period of John Clare and his responses to the enclosure movement, um, or Rachel Carson in the late 20th century, Silent Spring and her responses to uh, pesticide use and biodiversity loss. Um, and there are all kinds of political issues about around nature at the moment, around uh, global heating, land access, biodiversity and so on, that for me the best nature writing um, engages with without necessarily, as I'm saying, being polemical or tub thumping. Um, and at its best, I think, it can provide genuine insights into our relationship with the non-human world and generate new, a new sense of connection. So it's, it's, it's not just a distraction for me. Um, certainly, and I'm talking autobiographically here, um, reading a lot of nature writing has changed how I see uh, the world. Um, it's made me much more observant. It's made me value the apparently insignificant details, you know, a flower on a verge, or um, a bird sort of passing my house or whatever in a way that I didn't before. So it's, it really has has done something to me. And I think there is sort of increasing evidence that it, it, it's, 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 it's affected other readers too in a really positive way. I'm at time now. So as a literature scholar, I did like to, I do like to have some quotations. I'll leave, I, I'm not going to talk through these. I'm just, I'm just going to sort of present them very briefly. Um, there's a quotation here from, from John Clare, um, a quotation from Gilbert White, and a quotation from Dorothy Wordsworth, who are three of the kind of key figures um, from the Romantic period, which I've been writing about for our book. And I suppose a couple of points I want to make about those are that they're, all three of them um, are interested in nature as an active force. They're kind of resistant to sort of um, taxonomy to uh, drying the plant or torturing the butterfly by sticking it on a cork board with a pin, as Claire puts it. They like to think about nature in motion. Um, they're all um, based on very careful personal observation. Um, so whenever I see a woodpecker, um, I always think of Gilbert White talking about them flying in an undulating fashion, opening and closing their wings at every stoke, which is, is, is what they do and are always rising and falling in curves. And, and finally, again, this, this ability to find the significance in the apparently insignificant. So Dorothy Wordsworth here, with a wonderful passage about the breezes um, across the surface of Grasmere Lake and the ripples that they generate, um, and something that would be very easy to ignore, but she gives re real um, importance and value to. I'll finish there, thanks very much. Hello everybody and thank you very much to David. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm not on camera at the moment because I did have some worries about uh, bandwidth problems in my house so I hope I will reappear later on at the end of the presentation. But as David says um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the public engagement side of the Landlines project. So we've not only been exploring a set of research questions and developing our academic outputs, but public engagement has really been at the heart of our project, from its inception to its two current follow-on strands. And as David also said, our aim isn't just to, to further the impact of our own research, but also to encourage people to engage with nature writing, to participate in it, and also to engage with nature itself. So throughout the, the whole Landlines project, we've had various events and activities going on. And you can just see some examples here of some of our earlier events. So in the top left corner, you can see David himself giving a talk on romantic writers and the mystery of birds at the Booth Museum in Brighton. Um, we, we ran some workshops in Scotland with young adults. Uh, and so in the top right, you can see Dr. Christina Alp from the Landlines team with the writer, Professor John Burnside. Um, and then in the, the bottom left corner, 
an event as part of the Landlines Conference at the absolutely beautiful Leeds Library, which is a very old subscription library. And in the picture, you can see nature writers, Richard Kerridge, Miriam Darlington, Patrick Barkham, and the conversation was being led by the nature writer, Richard Smith. Um, and we've also been out and about. So bottom right hand corner, you can see our visiting scholar, Jesse Peterson, who was running a workshop for children at the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust Living Seas Centre. So those events were taking place in specific locations, but we've also helped to run some high profile events that have involved the whole of the UK. And one of these was the Landlines Poll, run in collaboration with the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which took place in 2017-18. And it was inspired by our fascination with the, the contemporary popularity of the genre. And so we invited members of the public to nominate their favourite nature book and give a short explanation for their choice. There were 768 nominations, which included 278 different books by 213 different authors. And uh, we've, we've asked you today to nominate your favourite nature books. So at the end of the presentation, we're hopefully going to get the results of, of our own poll today. From all of those public nominations we had for our poll, we got an expert panel together led by our own Professor Graham Huggan, and they drew up a short list of 10 titles, which you can see in this picture. And then we invited everyone to vote again um, to choose their number one choice from the list. And we received 7,300 votes in total. You may have seen this in the news. The winner by a very large margin was Chris Packham's Fingers in the Sparkle Jar. There's no doubt that Chris's celebrity status played into the victory, but we really felt the book was a worthy winner. As David says, Nature writing is more complex, diverse and experimental and rhetorically self-conscious than has often been assumed. And Chris's book really exemplifies these qualities. It mixes different narrative perspectives and time frames. It's informative, it's funny, profound, heartbreaking, and it's got this kind of punk sensibility running through it, which makes it really unusual. Chris was quite self-deprecating about his win, and he said that it was a kind of boaty McBoat face sort of choice by the British public. But I think actually he was very pleased that his nature writing, um, rather than just the aspect of the book that dealt with his Asperger's syndrome, had received such a claim. And I think one of the reasons why this book was so popular with the public is because it talks about suburban wildlife. It talks about the nature that's on our doorsteps that we all have access to. Um, rather than some remote wilderness that, that we couldn't reach ourselves. The poll was really widely reported and according to the Arts and Humanities Research Council, we reached over 30 million people through our media coverage. Another nationwide activity has been the online crowdsource Spring Nature Diary, which we um, participated in and helped to host in March 2019 and this year. <clears throat> we had a really good response from the public in both years, but this year has, has been kind of special and interesting for obvious reasons. And we realised, because the, the diary took place just as lockdown was beginning, we realised that the, the entries that were coming in were beginning to form an absolutely fascinating, unique record of what nature meant to people in these in this time of kind of global crisis. So as David mentioned, we've got two follow-on projects on the go at the moment, um, both completely concerned with public engagement. And so the first is called Nature Writing Beyond the Page, Tracks, Traces and Trails. Um, and it's looking for creative ways of bringing normally hidden elements of nature to light. For example, the lives of migratory or nocturnal animals. We've been working with an artistic director, Susie Cross, and collaborating with schools, community groups, and two Natural England nature reserves in Yorkshire. In the picture on the left, you can see a lovely display of lanterns, which were created by our schools and also a community group for older adults called Caring Together, um, helped by the puppet makers Handmade Parade. The second follow-on project, Tipping Points, 
is concerned with cultural responses to initi initiatives designed to increase biodiversity, especially on agricultural land. And it centers around the question of what the wild might mean um, in our country, um, of which so much is farmed. It's been a bit of a challenge working out how to continue our activities um, with the, the current measures of, of social distancing. But a recent success has been our Nightjar Nights, um, which was celebrating this mysterious nocturnal and migratory bird, one actually that Gilbert White wrote very beautifully about. And it was inspired by the habitat restoration being carried out by our project partners, Natural England, at the Humberhead Peatlands National Nature Reserve. We put on a whole series of events on the Landlines website um, from a downloadable night jar cutout, and you can see an example of that in the picture on the left, um, to new writing by Nita Roy and Sarah Hudson, a film from Stephen Moss, and input from the Natural England Reserve Manager, Tim Kohler, um, also members of the School of English, including David. On the right hand side of the, of the page, you can see some work done by the local schools who also had a, an educational night jar project um, which had been put together by the landlines team. And we've got various forthcoming activities coming up, one of which is to commission some soundscapes. We've been trying to think about how to take nature beyond the page. Um, and so we're asking sonic artists to make soundscapes that will help to foster a multi-sensory appreciation of the natural world. And also going back to the page again, a children's book about the night jar, um, written by Steve Smallman and also illustrated by him. And he's going to be working with children to um, both to, to kind of co-create the book, but also to create murals for the nature reserves. And you can see a previous example of his work there. So in terms of the Tipping Points project, it's got two main strands and one of them is to actually bring farmers and conservationists and arts and humanities practitioners together to think about how farming is represented in contemporary culture, including nature writing, and to try and explore some of the, the obstacles, um, cultural as well, as well as practical, facing farmers when they want to implement more nature-friendly methods. Um, and the symposium is going to be led by a team of expert facilitators, led by Barbara Bray, who you see pictured, who's the director of the Oxford Farming Conference. We're also delighted that we're able to put on some online nature writing workshops and visual art, arts workshops, um, which will be taking place, we think, towards the end of this year and in early next year. And in these pictures, you can see the writing leaders, um, the first one, Testament, author of the brilliant play, Black Men Walking, Harriet Fraser from the Somewhere Nowhere Project, and Amy Jane Beer. For any of you who read The Guardian, she's a very frequent contributor to the Country Diary. And below them, you can see some of the landscapes that they'll be using as inspirations for their nature writing, all places in which agricultural methods are being adapted to increase biodiversity. So Sturley Community Farm near Huddersfield, the Wild Ennerdale Project in Cumbria, and Castle Howard Estate in Yorkshire. The visual arts workshops are going to be led by two people from the University of Leeds School of Design, Dr. Judith Tucker and Melanie Rose, both of whom are renowned nationally and internationally for their work as landscape painters. As David said, the Landlines website has played quite a major role in the project, especially in connecting um, us with not only with national but international audiences. And I thought you might like to see this map of the world with the pink areas showing where we have reached audiences. Um, and also shout out to anyone in Greenland um, you're missing from our map. So finally, I wanted to extend our invitation to get involved um, to, to all of you who are listening today. Um, we'd love it if you wanted to participate in our workshops which are coming up. 
and also to receive guest blog entries. We've had lots of blog entries from members of the public who have wanted to talk about their favourite nature books or their favourite landscapes, their favourite animals. Um, and it's been a very, it gets a lot of uh, readers and it's been a very successful element of our public engagement. So I think my time is up and I'm hoping that we're now going to be able to see the results of our own poll that we've run with you today. Ah. So I don't know if um, David wants to, to come back in and talk to this. I think he'll be pleased to see some of the romantic writers featured there. Um, I've just, so I've just seen this immediately. I suppose, well, I suppose the issue of, of genres is, is, is interesting immediately. Um, so there are, there are, I mean, all, I think all of these books could very plausibly be, be called nature writing, but um, there's words verse epic poem, the prelude, there's um, Peter Rabbit and Warship Down, so fictional narratives aimed largely at, well, partly at children, um, Theory of Evolution, Darwin, a book associated with history of science, um, White Selborne, and then books, sort of modern books that are more focused, obviously focused on the kind of content, the new nature writing, sometimes called Sight Lines, Wildwood, Common Ground, and so on. And H is for Orc, which I, sort of, I, I always say H is for Orc, in a sort of Cockney way. Um, H is for Orc is a sort of, um, which I came up in the Q&A, which, you know, could plausibly play, be placed as, as more, of, more of an autobiography than it is, is nature writing. Um, but it's, it's, it's not surprising, though it is pleasing to see the lost words taking kind of centre stage in, in, the, in the word cloud. Um, I've, I've used to read it to my... Um, young son a lot and he, he absolutely loved it when he was sort of um two and two and three so um and i'm not surprised that it's been so successful and i think that's that's an example of a book that that's kind of been rolled out at a sort of national scale and in schools and has hopefully helped to foster a sort of stronger connection with the natural world among um, children what do you think pippa yeah, I'm, well, first of all, I think this is a very, very discerning selection. Absolutely excellent. <laughs> um, but also I'm very pleased to see the Lost Words there right in the middle, um, obviously the most popular nomination. I think when we did the poll, it was only just beginning to gain traction mm -hmm. around the country. But I think it's, as you say, you know, it's been rolled out in schools um, all around the UK. And I think it brings out this idea that in order to kind of love and care for nature you need to know about nature and so reintroducing those elements of the natural world that have kind of begun to to be lost from children's experience of the world is really important and also is a testament to, to how culture and how nature writing in particular can play a really important role in that so uh, i think that's a, a very good result I don't know if we should bring Frank back in now and uh, move to the Q and A, if that's okay. We can indeed. Thank you. Hi, right Frank. on, right on cue. Hi. So um, the way we'll we'll run this is we have on the chat um, quite a, a number of questions. Can I just say, as Professor of German, I was I was intrigued to see Theodor Storm's Der Schimmelreiter in there on, as one of the selections, which is kind of probably a, a very early eco-critical novella, but that's just by the by. So we've got some very interesting questions and I'd like to, as I say, take all of those. Um, the, you will, everybody in the webinar should be able to see the open questions. If I could start with one from Mark Crow. Thank you, Mark, for, for your question. Um, you notice, um, you are making an observation really about um, some of the recent trends for wild swimming, wild camping, etc. That that can come with an environmental impact. I guess you're you're asking or observing you, whether the extent to which the popularisation of nature writing has engendered a sense of entitlement to wild experiences. Um, is that anything, would you, David or Pippa, like to chip in? And uh, it's not a question as such, but if you've any thoughts on that. I mean, I could say something. Is that OK, Pippa, or do you want to? Yeah, of course. No, you, know, you go first. Um, I think it's a really it's a really difficult one, and I, I feel very torn about it. Um, I think kind of uh, 
politically and intellectually, um, I'm you know very much in support of kind of access, um, but access comes with a cost. And you know, in terms of my kind of personal sensibility, um, if I'm honest, there's nothing I like more than going to a nature reserve at 4.30 in the morning and seeing nobody else there. So that, that's the kind of romanticist in me, I suppose. There's a kind of contradiction in that. Um, and if, 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 if a place becomes too popular um, and isn't treated well, then it, it loses what's special about it. Um, it's not a circle that can easily be squared, I suppose. Um, I mean, this is a kind of stock response in some ways, but it, it, I think it's a true one that it, it does come back to kind of education and what happens at school um, and the sort of people's experience of these places and the way they value these places when they're young. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on that recently. I'm thinking not only of the lost words, but the um, kind of campaign to have a natural history uh, GCSE. So in the short term, I think it, we are going to, be in this situation particularly with more uh, staycationing um, where there's r real pressure on some some very special places but I'm hoping in, hoping in, in the long term um, if we have a kind of more sensible education system which I realize is a big if um, that that might improve do you have anything to, to add Pippa? I was going to say quite similar things actually David that I think um, open access is really vital and with so much of our landscape in private ownership, um, I'm not surprised that there's such pressure on the, the, the yeah. parks and reserves and so on. Um, I have seen really distressing reports of, of the kind of litter being left in the, the nature reserves in beautiful places. And I think, as you say, it's partly a, a question of, of education and people knowing how to, to be in the countryside uh, which again is perhaps missing from um, our educations and might perhaps be restored as things like the, the natural history GCAC come back in. I also think that the COVID situation and lockdown has created a kind of response, counter response, which has led to some quite wild behaviour and I'm not sure that's going to carry on forever and I don't think that it's particularly to, to do with, you know, the, the kind of cultural representations of nature. I think it's a very specific situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pippa. Could I, could I just um, ask, ask you a question? I mean, the, I, I mentioned in the preamble the amazing reach um, um, that your project has had and the interest that it's generated. And I wonder if you could give us a sense of what you took away as what people valued the most when they were nominating books for the landline's poll yeah i mean actually very similar to, to what david was saying in his talk um about the the nature writing that they'd read shaping their relations with the natural world um that people talked about reading books as, as children um and there were quite a lot of children books that were nominated especially wind in the willows um but ha these books having fostered in them a real deep love for nature, for the natural world that they then carried on through their lives. Um, I think also, which I think David also mentioned, that these nature books sometimes help to inform how they see the natural world, how they look at it, so that you might learn methods of, of attentiveness that might you might not otherwise have, have come to. And I think for me personally, reading the work of Kathleen Jamie has been immensely helpful in this, the, the kind of attentiveness she brings to things and the way she lets that attentiveness then suggest um, thoughts about the, the bigger picture, more kind of philosophical ideas. Okay, thank you. Could, could I maybe just picking up a question that Hannah Bright, thank you for your question Hannah has asked, um, which is the second one on the list there. Um, and uh, Hannah's asking whether nature writing uh, or reading nature writing has been a voyeuristic pursuit. Has it always been a voyeuristic pursuit? Encouraging people to read about getting out into nature rather than actually getting, get, sorry, encouraging people to read about getting out into nature rather than actually doing the real thing and getting into, out into nature themselves. Do you want to lead on this one? Pippa? Um, Pippa? Yes, okay. Um, 
Yes, I, th I think it's a great question. I think there's definitely an element of that, um, that it becomes a kind of armchair activity rather than a going out into to the to nature itself. Um, I think I think there's there's kind of two answers to this, and I think on the one hand, from from what we've seen, especially of the way people have got involved in the landmines project, it really has involved getting out into nature, and people have sent us their own nature writing, very much based on their experiences out in nature. But I think there's a very serious question to be asked, which is, if nature writing is so very popular, why isn't conservation and actually dealing with some of the larger environmental problems we're facing, why is that not rising really to the top of the agenda? So, you know, I think that, that in that respect, there may be a kind of voyeuristic rather than active element. Okay, just thank to, you. Yes. Can I give a footnote yeah. to that? I mean, just to add really that I think for me, it's also a question about writing as, as Hannah, Hannah put it, writing and reading. And I suppose for me, a lot of the most interesting nature writing is kind of troubled by the fact that it's writing, is um, worried about how writing can take you away, um, but also interested in how writing can bring you back. And I think the power of kind of um, uh, attentiveness, as Pippa put it, but also the power of naming in relation to that, the sort of knowing the names of things um, is a kind of simple thing, but it can be something engendered by nature writing that can really help people people kind of reconnect. So in a way, maybe nature writing has to sort of take you out of your environment in order to put you back in into it in a different way. Okay, Thank, thanks, David. Could you maybe pick up Jim Greenwood's question, which is essentially one around genre and classification of different types of writing, which has been alluded to earlier. If you can see that one. So questions, oh, yes, where would you it, put yeah. these books in yeah. Waterstones? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, I think it's a really good question. I think you can, you could, you could put them in, I in either place, really. Um, I mean, Helen McDonald's book has been incredibly popular and award winning. Um, I think there is a kind of challenge around that book in terms of um, the relationship with the goshawk and issues of kind of control and ownership, I suppose. Um, and it, it, it's a kind of confessional narrative um, like um, Amy Liptrot's The Outrunner, Richard Avery's Nature, Nature Cure. So there's that Rousseauian element of confession there, which not all nature writing had. So Gilbert White is kind of personal without being confessional. But I think ultimately, you know, these boundaries are fluid ones. And partly it, the, their decisions, they're kind of economic decisions, I suppose, among other things, the decisions made by, made by marketing people. Cool. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm kind of trying to link the questions in some sort of rational way. So maybe if we could just jump ahead, there's a question around, you know, I'm thinking economic considerations and marketing around book prizes and criteria that are uh, deemed to be key when various prize awards are made. If either of you would like to comment on that one. So that is from yeah. Vic West, yeah? I don't know, actually, I'm just going to give you, a, I'm, I'm not sure if they, they really, they don't, do they give, I don't think those prizes have published criteria, do they, Pippa? Not that I've seen, and uh, sadly I've never been invited to be on the panel judging one of these. Um, I imagine things like originality, um, but also yeah, I mean, it's it's such a good question, really. Does it does it involve that scientific knowledge you were talking about? Does um, a, a nature writer have to be au fait with um, the, the you know with natural history, with the names of animals and birds, and so on? Um, I suspect the criteria will be shifting quite rapidly. If you've seen the the recent Wainwright shortlist, um, I think they might be asking a slightly different set of questions. Does, does Wainwright, I think, off the top of my head, differ? Are there two prizes, one that's more kind of focused on ecological writing and one that's more focused on sort of personal nature writing? I think they, they do make that, that distinction. But it's, again, you can imagine a book potentially going for both, both categories in a way. And that's, that's the challenge of, of the form, I suppose, that it is so uh, porous. Okay. 
thank you. Um, if I can jump ahead again, there's a question from Pete Judge. I'm going to put this your way, Pippa, having mentioned your musician's background. It's a question really about different art forms, really, and how they might relate to nature writing, specifically um, the contribution that music and musicians might be able to make to the culture of native, um, um, nature writing and the whole climate change debate. Um, I think, as um, I was saying in the presentation, we've, we've been looking at sonic artists creating some multi-sensory artworks. Um, and I think there are many different ways that you can experience the, the natural world. Um, and the, the kind of oral dimension is, is a very important one, which I think musicians can kind of bring to light. I've heard lovely compositions which have worked with bird song. Um, and I think that it's a form of, it's another form of translation that's not so dependent on language, or at least not wholly dependent on language, um, to, to bring knowledge into you culturally. Um, in terms of how they can contribute to, to activism, I think that's a very broad question. And, you know, that obviously there are some songs which are highly successful as polemical pieces um, and might really reach a popular audience. More subtly, I think it might be music that reflects on the natural world in a very serious way and brings that reflection to its audiences. And uh, I'm really pleased to see a question from Pete, and I'm wondering if it's Three Cane Whale, Pete, because I was going to mention the group Three Cane Whale, who make beautiful compositions in landscape and about landscape and they are part of this kind of weave of love that you might have for, for nature and for particular areas of the country. Okay, thank you. We've got a couple of questions around issues of um, diversity and inclusion. One from Jules Townsend, and then one um, from Katie Parry. Um, maybe if we could start with Jules, um, I'll not read the whole question out, but it's um, um, really raising the question whether there's a need for further self-reflection and self-awareness on issues of inclusion and diversity amongst nature writers, and can nature writing play a part in promoting more sustainable and inclusive access to nature? David, would you perhaps like to have a go at that one? I can try. Um, yeah. I... I mean, it's really well put, I think, Jules's question. Um, and, and I share that frustration that one of the things that nature writing, I think, often does is it kind of, it puts aside all the sort, it, it tries to kind of obscure, I think, the sort of dirty business of who gets to access where, by what means, what the kind of infrastructure is that allows the writer himself or herself often himself to, to to have the time and the the money to to do this um and i i i mean i don't know how, how you get around that but i kind of, sometimes it's almost as if uh, the sort of autobiographical self is kind of teleported to this particular sublime landscape and it's like well how did you get there how did you find the time to do all this wild camping um who's looking after your kids all that stuff and I, th I think for me, I, I like the nature writing that's kind of a bit more um, where the kind of everyday business of, of surviving is, is, is interweaved um, with the, this kind of um, more, um, I don't know, sublime, if you want that, to use that word, experiences. And perhaps, um, you know, people can't help. I'm not, I don't, I think sometimes McFarlane, for example, gets a bit of a hard time and he can't help where, he, you know, his background, where <laughs> none of us can. But I think it's the way in which you deal with it and the way in which you you acknowledge all that allows you to have these experiences, which, which as, as Jules points out, are for, for often for very practical reasons are not available to large parts of the population. Thank you, David. Pippa, question for you um, from Kerry Pitches. Um, this is around how the research findings were used to contribute and or influence the design, contribute to and influence the design of the public engagement activities? Always one of the hardest questions to answer. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> but um, I, I think in a number of ways, one of them is 
from looking at the early nature writers who were not yet considered to be nature writers per se, but they were not professional scientists necessarily, they were not professional writers necessarily, but they had a deeply ingrained love of the natural world. And I think that's developed into the more modern phenomenon of citizen science. And I think what we were doing in some of our engagement activities was really encouraging that participatory citizen nature writing um, strand, which, which links with the early days of, of the genre. Um, and that's been one of our most successful elements, I think, of public engagement that we, we do feel that we've really encouraged people to participate with the crowdsource Spring Nature Diary, um, with guest blogging and so on. Um, I don't know if David would like to speak to, to the, the kind of research questions that the original writing team brought to the project in terms of the engagement activities. Um. Maybe, I wonder if we should move on to a different question because there's, there's still quite a few. There's still um, quite a few to yeah. go and we, we, we only have a, a matter of minutes right. remaining. There's a quick question maybe about children's, the best writing for children. Uh, yeah, sorry, just finding that. So I guess the best nature writers for children, I suppose, uh, any, any recommendations or tips there? That's Ruth Lewis's question. Yeah, I sh I, as I have young children, I, sh I should, should be able to answer that. I think one of the problem troubling things about children's books is that they're so full of um, images of, uh, they suggest this kind of uh, plethora of, of, of the animal world and all these creatures, and often the creatures that they represent are sort of, um, in reality, very much um, struggling and endangered. So um, I think kind of the sort of simple books about uh, there are some nice books produced by the RSPB, uh, various wildlife trusts. The, the books that we're doing with Natural England, in fact, the Nightjar book, that are much more kind of grounded and aren't about kind of fetishizing exotic animals, but actually are about the birds and animals that are kind of every day. Um, I can't easily think of authors that spring to mind. Can you help me out, Pippa? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm resisting the temptation to look round at my bookshelf here, which I know will have um we'll have authors uh, the one that springs to mind um for me is julia donaldson um and the snail and the whale and that kind of thing and the idea of kind of weaving narratives around creatures sometimes which do involve a nod to environmental issues um but they don't make them too upsetting for the children and nevertheless they are, they are kind of educational in one respect but also really entertaining and i think we'll foster that kind of love of of creatures including snails which is not always <laughs> okay thanks um david could you pick up um, our colleague john wales question please absolutely yes. really about engaging with 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 land users and the oppositionality that's uh, yeah it's, it's inherent in that dynamic it's a hugely difficult one um and i you know i I see it played out a lot on Twitter with kind of um, uh, people sort of basically uh, lambasting farmers and landowners for being, um, and particularly grass moor owners, perhaps reasonably enough, for being kind of um, environmentally blind. Um, and at the same time, I think that the kind of, you know, there is much to kind of be angry about in terms of land use, but the kind of very oppositional rhetoric you get from someone like George Monway seems to me counterproductive i think pippa would be better placed to answer this to me because it's, it's key to the kind of work that you're doing isn't it okay very much so yeah i mean the, the tipping points project and the love and soil symposium is inspired by seeing in some contemporary nature writing a kind of vilification of farmers across the board um, without really an attempt to to understand the, the problems that they face or the systemic problems and so on um i think there are quite a lot of grassroots organizations now working with farmers to bridge that divide um, and uh, to, to work towards much more kind of positive futures for the landscapes that they're working in. Okay, thank you. And maybe if we can turn finally Richard Needham's question, which is at the bottom of the, the list and it's really around how might, how do you see nature writing developing as the environmental crisis deepens? Maybe if we take that that part of the question. Um, David? 
yeah i mean it's it's a kind it's kind of worrying nature writing often has a kind of elegiac element built into it um it kind of looks you know it's, it's the pastoral element i suppose it looks back to a time of plenty that's been lost and increasingly i think in nature writing you see you see this kind, what you might call a kind of proleptic um, elegy so it, it looks it, it's looking forward into the future where when even more will be lost um and you know i've read some pretty um gloomy stuff recently i must admit about the you know the, the, the likely future of our environment um my hope is that i think that's really important but my hope is that um writing will emerge more writing will emerge that's kind of realistic about the challenges we face but offers these kind of um sort of St stories about local solutions um, and uh, the positive things that individuals and, and communities can do because the solutions of the future are not going to be kind of huge technocratic ones I think they are going to be more localized than that do you want to add anything Pippa? Um, I was just to say I think contemporary nature writing is rising to the challenge and you've got books like Robert McFarlane's Underland which is very much a book of the Anthropocene um, Kathleen Jamie's new book surfacing and I think on a big scale, they, they kind of put forward the problem um, in a very clear way. Um, but I also think that, um, as you say, that the kind of books that account for small scale um, positive action are really, really important as well. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to draw things to a close now. There's been a really extensive um, Q&A session, and I think one way or another we managed to um, uh, answer the, the, the various questions, the dozen or so questions that came in. So I'm going to wrap things up with a few words of thanks. First of all to you, our alumni audience, something approaching a hundred of you from numerous different countries around the world, which is very exciting to see. Argentina, China, Indonesia, Korea, Nigeria, Ghana and Uganda, and a fair few of you closer to your former Leeds home. Um, can I thank the alumni team um, who've worked um, assiduously with the Cultural Institute to put on this wonderful series of four um, talks showcasing the arts and humanities. And um, finally, um, can I, on behalf of everyone, thank David and Pippa for an absolutely fascinating talk and um, very engaging uh, responses that, you, well, that you've given and to wish you all the very best with the future projects. There is uh, an evaluation for folk um, to um, complete if you'd like. We're very keen to get some feedback on these events and with that I wish you all a very pleasant summer or what is left of it for us. Thank you and goodbye from sunny Yorkshire.